of uh, Michael Rotundi and his mystery budgets. We have been able to invite Svi Hecker from Berlin and Tel Aviv to lecture here on uh, October 27th. A few other uh, uh, small announcements. Uh, Angeli Cafe will be open after the lecture for your dining enjoyment. Uh, and of course, before you enjoy their dining, you must enjoy uh, the student uh, reception with its cheap beer and chips. It's still cheap. Uh, and one more request. Uh, we uh, would love some help in making sure that our beautiful new chairs remain in this room and also uh, get stacked up safely at the end of the lecture. If anyone wants to volunteer to help us stack them up after the lecture, that would be greatly appreciated. Now, tonight's lecturer is uh, Tom Matano, who designs cars. You might ask, why do we have a car designer at an architecture school? Well, you might say that cars are architecture in motion, that they are a structure in which we spend a great deal more time often than in our offices, studios, or apartments. They are also objects who, because of the advanced engineering and the amount of time, energy, and money that we spend on their design, represent a much more complex uh, design problem and one would hope solution uh, than many buildings that these cars race by. In fact, one might follow Craig Hodgetts in saying that the problem with the American city is not so much that we need to learn how to design better buildings, but that we need to learn how to design better cars. Someone who certainly seems to be capable of designing better cars is Tom Matano. Now, uh, Tom Matano, it appears, is completely addicted to cars. He recalls inhaling the sweet smells of gasoline in his uncle's gas station in Nagasaki uh, in the early 1950s when he was a tot. By the time he got to be four years old, uh, he remembers uh, riding in his uncle's Datsun, which had been assembled out of scrap. And his fetish uh, then settled on the red leather seats of a Morris Minor, uh, which he remember be, remembers being in when he was five. Now, my family had a Morris Minor, but I have absolutely no memory of its seats. Uh, he then quickly progressed, or maybe regressed, to a love affair with um, the big American cars, and this led him to take a cargo ship to America in 1969, and he then greyhounded around the country, and he apparently did not fall in love with the greyhound, but he did fall in love with Southern California, and he came back to America a year or two later and enrolled at Art Center, where he uh, stopped being an engineer, in which he had received a degree in Tokyo, and started to become a car designer. However, many other uh, polymorphous desires then took him all around the world. And in a space of 10 years, he managed to uh, work in, for GM in Warren, Michigan, for GM in Australia for six years, for BMW in Munich, and finally he settled with Mazda Design uh, in Southern California in 1983, just as the Mazda Miata project was coming off the ground. And having successfully shepherded that project through, he eventually became uh, executive vice president of Mazda Design and uh, helped in the transformation of uh, Mazda's car line from the kind of heterogeneous models which one expects from most car designers into a streamlined series of cars that all are closely related in their design and by this time include the MX-3, the MX-6, the 626, the 929, and the RX-7 as well as the uh, Navajo truck and the MPV van which was the other uh, project that Tom Matano worked on very early on and which is of course uh, the car that our director uh, manages somehow to escape in. Uh, having produced all of these wonderful cars, I hope that uh, Tom Matano will be able to explain his strange fetishes and desires to us. Please help me in welcoming Tom Matano. Somebody took my script, but <laughs> I'll go without it. Is that a one? Okay. Now I can do it without it. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, good evening. Actually, my first part of a presentation was my 
personal history, but I haven't gone through most of them, so I lost my first part. <laughs> uh, slide, please. Okay, actually, it's kind of interesting. The reason why I agreed to come to this one here is because originally I wanted to be architecture design instead of car design. So I would like to meet some of you that who are lucky enough to be in architectural field rather than automotive design, I suppose. Um, my daily work responsibility in that building over there in Irvine, California, is to design and propose the future of Mazda vehicle for USA and some advanced projects. And also, uh, we do um, some joint venture with Ford. And I oversee all the design activities and uh, propose that to Japan. Also, I serve as the uh, International Design Committee for Mazda for our headquarters. Now, um, I was going to talk about some of our design work. And also, I'll give you something called design as a science. It's we are trying to develop the system of analysis to view the design. So that may be of uh, some interest to you tonight. OK? Um, like Aaron said, automotive design uh, is, to my mind, very similar to architecture in a way of type of material we use. We use steel, except the concrete. We don't use concrete or brick. <laughs> but we use steel and plastic, aluminum, you know, fabric and so forth. And also, we also uh, house people inside. Only difference, I guess, is that the car moves and house or building stays put. So that's really the difference, I suppose. Um, let me go through quickly, because Aaron went through my history, but I'll give you some graphic example of it. As he said, I was born in Nagasaki City, which is uh, west end of Japan. And I used to call him a Latin side of it, because my love for Italian food and so forth, I think, came from that side of Japan. Um, so would you please turn to the next slide, please? OK, so that's where. <laughs> Okay, well, from there, like I said, my first association with gasoline or cars is that my grandfather's gas stations. And within our professions, we call them a gas head. And it's a very important quality to be a car designer. You have to love cars to be a really good designer. So I guess I was fortunate enough to have the, the head start when I was about three years old and inhaling those gasolines every day. And I still remember the smell of the gasoline at the first time when I stepped into that shop. And I still love the smell. Actually, when I was about 10 years old uh, going to school, I had to give a couple buses a miss to just smell the exhaust gas and stuff. So <laughs> I guess I was pretty sick then. Um, OK, um, next slide, please. As he mentioned, that the uh, first American culture that I encountered with was actually 57 Cadillac that my grandfather owned. And had those thick doors and chromes and tail fins and so forth. But one interesting feature I still remember is that there are clear ducts on the rear shelf going through to the ceiling. And then it happened to be the, the air conditioner. But when I was about five or six years old, that I didn't know that it was. And there are no air conditioning in Japan at the time for houses or let alone the cars. So that was really fascinated by it. And I love to buy ice cream and sit in a car because like, it wouldn't melt as quick as outside. <laughs> and so you know, from those point of view, uh, I decided I'm going to go into uh, study engineering later on. So I enrolled to uh, one of the university in Tokyo, took up analysis engineering. But during that period, I used to go to an uh, architect's office, visited there, help him making models, and put some ideas to him and see whether I'm capable of designing something. And he su suggested that the only way to become a, some kind of a design field that is you have to go to the art school. So would you please turn to the next slides? <laughs> I mean, this, <laughs> this gets funnier. So I came to the uh, <laughs> Los Angeles and also Greyhound bus through the whole country and all. Um, I'm the first boat people. I came in with a cargo ship. So, But actually, I landed in Everett, Seattle, Washington, then 
right around the Greyhound bus for altogether about 180 hours. Then I went to Art Center School of Design, which was in Los Angeles at a time. I saw their work and I fell in love with it. So following year, I decided to came back to the States and applied for the school. My first try was a failure. School sent me a letter saying, your artwork is below the quality that we accept. Because I never drawn anything at a time. And second time, I started drawing some perspective drawing of the interior. Requires like tables and chairs in the right place and the right proportions and so forth, which I couldn't do. So I decided to draw cars because I've been drawing doodling cars all along in my life up till then. So I drew cars and fortunate enough, I was accepted to the art center as a transportation design major. You turn the next slides, please. Okay. And upon graduation, I got a uh, job offer from General Motors design staff in Detroit. So uh, I moved to Detroit, spent a year and a half or so. That was 1974, the first energy crisis. So economy was pretty bad, and so many designers been laid off from like Ford and Chrysler. So I couldn't renew my work permit to stay on. So then, would you please turn to the next slide? Then GM decided. I should work in Australia. <laughs> so I went to Australia. Yeah, yeah every time I move, it's kind of drastic. You know, four or 5,000 miles at the time. And I spent six and a half years over there. And Australia is an interesting place to live, but as a leading edge technologies and so forth, we are fell behind. So I felt like being in Australia too long is like you were left behind in automotive scene. So I decided to look for another place to work. And I pick Europe as the next destination. Since I cross around you know, half one side of the, the world, so I should go to the extreme end of the world. world. Turn the slides, please. So I went to that end of the <laughs> map, and I went to Europe. Um, the reason I chose the uh, BMW was because I've been working with the American School of Design at GM, I wanted to learn the European School of Design how they can design the cars for a prolonged time. BMW usually design cars for 10 years and introduce it and keep it in the marketplace for 10 years. So altogether 20 years. Uh, it's a really long time. The, my work at BMW was a three series BMW just introduced about a year, year and a half ago, which I worked on 1982. So it's a 10 year deal. But after a while, I realized that being in BMW is that you're stuck with one car for 10 years, and then you stay on in charge of that car until the car replaced by another one 20 years later. And of course, BMW has three or four sedan series in one or two coupes, but that's about all I can design. And lucky that I could get two or three works done within my career of 25 years or so. So I decided that's not really what I wanted to do. And fortunately enough, at a time, I was called in by Mazda, turn the slides, please, um, to come to California. After a year, year and a half in Germany, it was too cold, you know, 27 below zero, so forth, and I didn't really like the cold climate, and California sounded so good. So I came back to the States after 10 years absent and uh, start working for Mazda. If you turn the slides, please. And then at a the time, as Aaron mentioned again, uh, we started Miata, an MPV project. If you turn the uh, slides, please. And then as he mentioned again, see, he took all the, the statement out here. Uh, those five cars um, been introduced in the last two years or so that changed the face of Mazda somehow. If you turn the slides, please. This is our latest uh, being introduced in September to California market. It's a uh, Ford Ranger with Monster Sheet Metal. So it's a new joint venture. Uh, to avoid the import tax of a uh, truck coming into this country, 25% tax. So this is one of those things that we have to face with now is to work with other company, yet maintaining some identity for each one. So this is one of the example of it that we worked on. If you turn the slides, please. 
Okay, let me go through some of the, uh, the, the design work of my personal work and also our studio. Would you turn the slides, please? Now, this was my graduation work for Art Center back in 1974. This is a wall I presented to, uh, to GM, Ford Chrysler uh, designers for interview. Would you turn the slides, please? Okay. Uh, this is a, a GM project, GM-sponsored project. It was a three-wheeler program. I decided this is a city commuter, so I thought we should make a car kind of friendly to the scenery and the people around it, and I call it kind of cute car, and everybody laugh at me at the time, said car shouldn't be a cute, you know, cute word is not used for the cars. I mean, I had to prove them wrong 20 years later to do a Miata, but, uh, <laughs> but that's one of them. Turn the slides, please, see? So this is another view of it, okay? So this was my uh, school work. Could you turn the slides, please? Okay. And then this is a starting point of a Miata project. We went through all sorts of different design ideas at a time, very initially. So this is more like a cross between a motorcycle and a, and a car, and very, very primitive and lightweight and basics. Could you turn the slides, please? Um, this is a, a, some other idea sketches we've done knowing the safety rule of uh, uh, side impact bars and so forth, but still we wanted to have that open door feeling, so we put the glass over there to get that kind of a feeling. Turn the slides, please. Then went on, we start developing further and further. Um, that's, um, dates is there, 80, 82? Oh, wow. Um, so we develop more and more, and this time is not necessarily a front wheel drive, this is just uh, sketch to show the feeling of the, the sports car, the small sports car. Would you turn the slides, please? Again, further, we develop further, and this is definitely a front engine rear wheel drive. Turn the slides, please. And this is close to the final uh, proportion of a vehicle, very uh, traditional shape. Would you turn the slides, please? Okay. This is our first full-size clay model. This is clay model painted with a fiberglass roof and glasses put it on to uh, mimicking the actual car. This was back in 1984. And turn the slides, please. In fact, this was in competition with the, our counterparts in Japan. Um, and this is a presentation in Japan at uh, summer of 84. Um, before we went, we kind of knew what Japanese people will do. Uh, they will do a front engine coupe and a mid sports car, because that's pretty much the way that everybody's going at the time. MR2 came out later and uh, so forth. But we really wanted to have a uh, front engine rear wheel drive car. Okay, could you turn up the slides, please? This is one of the, our Japanese counter counterparts example. As you can see, you can put any badges on Nissan or Toyota or whoever. This is very neutral car, and any Japanese company could produce this vehicle. Turn the slides, please. So this is uh, our proposal, and this is final production model. Could you turn the slides, please? This is the uh, uh, show car we built for announcement of a Miata at uh, Chicago Auto Show for 19... 89 February. So we built this car, it's slightly wider fendered, a um, little bit more sportier to expand the concept of the Miata, not just uh, everyday sports car, but a little bit more like a Sunday racer. We call it uh, club racer. Turn the slides, please. And now, uh, also when we were working on this project, we had a concept, um, or we made a little story to explain this car, what this is. Um, we call it the car that every night before you go to bed, you wanna just peek into the garage and say good night to the car. Uh, or you wanna sit in a car just one last time, you know, to have a big smile before you go back to bed. Or instead of washing the car, you wanna shampoo the car. You know, all those terminology we use to explain what this car is all about. And story went on and on and on, like 
uh, first drive that gives you the feel that you expect it by just looking at a car and then like if you're living in a city then first out of town drive to a mountain or beaches the reflection in a car is different to what you normally see so you see the depth of design and then as a month the years gone by you you have much closer attachment to the vehicle and then some cases you have to part with the car but memories remain and then 10 20 years later you may go back and buy it and restore it and restore the memory as well so those are the kind of story we write and we wrote to explain to engineers and other people about the car now also at a time we also thought about having strong uh, club support to have an owner's club and that's the scenery here is one of the club having a, a picnic or some going out to some country road Turn the slides, please. I know this is kind of dark slide, but um, now we have 40,000 members uh, at a Club of America. And within four years, one of the single largest uh, one make car club in the world. And we still trying to support them by um, going out to uh, talk to owners and so forth. And story that we started off is now into a second chapter, which means the owner's side of the story and going crazy. Um, they wanted to have a birthday party for their cars, you know, the dates that they bought the car. They have a birthday party. <laughs> and one lady says, I thought I was crazy by having a birthday party, but came to the club and they realized there are a couple more people had a party already. Or they have a Miata wedding. Uh, I got the invitation for Miata wedding a couple of times. We haven't had a Miata divorce yet. and. <laughs> We don't know which part of the car they're going to take home with or whatever. Um, so, again, uh, story is going, going um, you know, now that each owner is developing or writing their own stories, and that's exactly what we wanted them to do. Turn the slides, please. Uh oh. <laughs> well, go, go to the next one then. So, this is one of the club events in Monterey, California. Each year we have a gathering in the in uh, Laguna Seeker Circuit to watch the historic car race go by and also gathering of a Miata each year. The reason why this is significant because we wanted to have Miata to be a classics in the future. So like someday we're gonna have a Miata in the race as a historic car. If you turn the, the slides please. Okay, this is an earlier sketch of MPB project Turn the slides, please. And this is first full-size uh, model that we presented to Japan. Turn the slides, please. And this is a show car called uh, MPV Executive, uh, which got like typewriters or computers and fax machines and so forth inside. Turn the slides, please. And this is the production model. Turn the slides, please. Now. Um, we do time to time uh, advanced concept study or just advanced design uh, form study. And this is one of those uh, form study uh, examples. We used to think of like 25 years ahead. So when 25 years gone by, I'll be gone by then. So I don't have to be held responsible for whatever we came up with 25 years earlier. And that free up your idea to go to uh, a lot of different things. And also, this is really a truth. If you look, look up 25 years and think of what we need, if needs are there, no matter how expensive the material is, no, no matter how hard the technology is, eventually come to affordable price somewhere. Just the, the arrival time could be different because of the economy of, uh, of the, the world or whatever, but eventually come to a reality. So I do believe in just stretch out and think of what you think would need for certain lifestyle or certain traffic or whatever, and it will come true. So this is one of those uh, examples. We wanted to study our organic shape that everybody's trying to go for, but we went further by having a little more form on the roof too. Everybody having a sing single sweep roof at a time, we have four bubbles on the roof. And this represent like four rotor, uh, four-seater sports car or a sports sedan. Turn the slides, please. 
Then we went to the next example. Uh, this is a three-rotor sports car. What if we do a three-rotor Mitch sports car? Because we had a racing car, IMSA racers doing the three-rotor racing. And I thought, after the race is done, we'd like to get that chassis and build this car and drive around it ourselves. So we did that, but the car never came, so we just got a plastic body left. Um, again, this is a design theme study. Could you turn the slides, please? You know, the form, the shadows, and lights to uh, create some kind of an emotional statement instead of just a stamping sheet metal. Could you turn the slides, please? And this one had a three bubbles on the roof because it was a three-rotor car. Could you turn the slides, please? This is an earlier sketch of the RX-7 project. Again, this is a two-rotor car, so I had two bubbles on the roof and make sure that wind tunnel proves that this would be effective. You know, we didn't want to do anything other than uh, styling, so it's got to be a functional. And it proved to be very functional in the end. Could you turn the slides, please? This is the earlier sketch again of the RX-7 um, theme. And we wanted to keep a very, very nimble, light, agile sports car instead of those luxury GT coupes. So this is one of the direction we took. And Bubbles are imminent again. Turn the slides, please. So we built the fifth scale model in the foreground from that sketch, and a background is a first generation. So this particular direction, we're trying to uh, chase the initial uh, RX-7 theme, modernize it, and carry on to the next century. Turn the slides, please. OK, again, this is the rear end um, to have that lighter, more uh, sports car look. Turn the slides, please. Um, and this is the rear end of the vehicle uh, with first and second generation RX-7. OK, could you turn the slides, please? This is another idea. This is Mr. Chin, another designer we have. He went from second generation and think of a third. So this is more like a little more ground touring a coupe type of direction. Turn the slides, please. And we built the model according to that sketch, and this is comparing with the second generation. Uh, we tested a wind tunnel. That rear end is not really effective in a tunnel. So turn the slides, please. So we got compromise of somewhat like first idea and this second idea together and testing the tunnel and everything. And this happened to be very, very good in a wind tunnel also. So this was the initial direction chosen for next stage, which is a full-size clay. Turn the slides, please. This is uh, one of the interior example. Uh, this is Mr. Chin's airbrush uh, of the interior. Um, when we did the RX-7 interior, we started off with a different um, concept. Most of the time, if you ask a designer to do the interior, they start with instrument panel, the gauges to start off with, then the, the dashboard, then go to the door or go to the center console. That's pretty much the thoughts that all the designer has. So we said, OK, look, we're going to do it a different way. You, you become a seat and support the driver from behind, and then just how to accommodate this driver into the car. And that was the philosophy we started off with. And the results is quite different. I mean, ended up with we have a gauges in the middle and everything, but idea was to sit the person, then when you close the door, hold their arm to guide the arm to the steering wheel. And when you fix there and look through the wheels, there will be a gauges in front of you. And that was sort of a story and concept we dealt with. And a lot of people who sat in RX-7 said something to that effect, that this feels different. This, this feels like support, supporting a lot more or snug fit. And that's exactly the word we use to uh, develop the interior. Could you turn the slides too? I just thought I'd just give you another example of the interior, too, just give you some of the different sketch style. This is a small sketch uh, to show the interior. OK, could you turn the slides? And this is the uh, final uh, interior of the production vehicle. Could you turn the slides, please? Now, during the course of development of RX-7 and all the other vehicles we design, in our studio at least, uh, take advantage of living in Southern California where there are a lot of collectors around and then the cars are kept in a good conditions. So we try to compare some of the uh, styling legend that stood the test of time for 20, 25 years to compare with our cars. And if our car 
keep this, the substance or presence against those cars, then we feel that our car have a strength to survive 10, 15 years as a design life. And this is one of those examples that we're trying to see what it's like comparing to the 300 SL Gullwing. Turn the slides, please. And also like 275 GTB, we had that in the studio and compare with our design to see what, you know, whether we have a presence against those vehicles. And certainly we did. Turn the slides, please. So we call this is an orange job. Um, after the red and the yellow, we thought the, the, the some kind of a nice orange could be a nice theme color for the sports car, so we painted it. Unfortunately, the, the, the manufacturing couldn't reproduce this type of color right now in a manufacturing plant, so maybe a few years yet. Turn the slides, please. So this is our original um, theme model that went on to a competition with our Japanese counterpart. Turn the slides, please. And then they shipped the, their clay model to USA to compare the two designs to, to select the final direction. With all the board of directors came over to our studio back in 88 to decide the direction. And fortunately enough, the art design has been picked for the final direction. Turn the, the slides, please. And this is the final um, design. Um, the, each car has got a different tensions on the shape. This one is like you are the athletes or you being through gyms and you know, train your muscles and car will tell you that, hey, look, I've been exercising and I've been, you know, train my muscles, so why not just hop in and go to your favorite road and test me? Um, that's the kind of message we wanted to send with this car. Turn the slides, please. Um, I may gonna go into something different here. Um, also, those five cars we designed, important part of our uh, theory was to depart from typical Japanese ink so-called Japanese design that, that cannot differentiate between Toyota, Nissan, or Mazda. Uh, ma we wanted to have a Mazda identity. Um, so one of the major part of it is that we wanted to create more emotional statement on the vehicles compared to some others. Could you turn the slides, please? Okay, that's the one of the final production also. Could you turn the slides, please? I'll show you some. Okay, now, this is another example. This is MX-6 Coupe, the first full-size model we shipped to Japan, okay? We have ongoing communication between Japanese studio and ourselves, and we have to understand how they react to our proposals. We found it out that they don't like kind of a, a, a fat or, you know, the, the, the large radii and so forth. They like more sharper edges and stuff. So turn to the next slide. I'll show you some example. After we sent our model, they translated to this. We lost a lot of flavor and feeling. And that happens every time we ship the model being chosen as a final design and they had to develop it to the production. And this is one of those examples that they really tighten all the radii to their likings. And we used to call them that's a sushi and sashimi. You know, you need to cook. There's no temperature or flavor. Uh, and they call our design is like steaks and hamburgers too greasy and too heavy. So, so but you know, by going through this communication, we get to adjust to where it's supposed to be. So turn to the next slide. And somehow we recovered that fatness a little bit. You know, we got a little more ice cream or whatever to get fatter but this is what we wanted to see on the road, and I think we got it just about right. Okay, turn the slides, please. Now, another interesting thing is like, um, this was the first time I went to Japan back in 84 to present our full-size uh, MPV model. As you can see, people are standing about 10 feet away from the, the, the model. I told them to stand back about 30 feet away and a few minutes later, they're slowly inching towards the model. And I had to call them back to, you know, my, my position where it's back against the wall three, four times in 15 minutes. Then I realized what it was, they're comfortable looking at a cars 10 feet away because that's the normal environment they live in. And I'm sort of uncomfortable 
close to the car because I my environment is 30, 40 feet away. And I realized why the Japanese tendency is to design the details so well because they see every little nick and knacks and gaps and so forth. And we rather have a car with more dynamic statement overall. So that's just environmental, you know, where we live in, it's a big difference. Turn the slides, please. This is normal distance we look at our cars in a studio. So we made a studio also to represent our market and our conditions. So we made it as large as possible to um, give us a close enough simulation to what the street scene will be. Also, this shows the white one in the foreground is the uh, 1967 first Rotary Sports Coupe called Cosmo. Uh, and second, yellow one is the first generation ARC-7, and uh, next one is second generation. Again, what it was, normally you may heard about this, that all the companies while developing their proposals, they usually compare with competitors like Corvettes or other sports cars, Porsches. We decided not going to do it. We're going to just compare with ourselves to get the heritage and s the, the smell of Mazda embedded into our proposal for the third generation. So while we are developing the design, we always kept those cars. And time to time, we brought different historic cars and just look at it. And that way, um, may change some design outcome. OK, turn the slides, please. This is like say, typical street of Japan. It's very, very narrow again. Also, interesting thing is, uh, because of their streets and traffic and so forth, not many people really be able to drive to work every day. They had to take trains, and they had to be on a pedestrian more. So they tend to look at the front end of the vehicle more, okay, because of that reasons. Turn the slides, please. And also, uh, because traffic is kind of heavy, so Instead of head in to park, they usually put the rear end first into the parking space. So that way, when you come out of the parking, at least you get all the clear vi visibility to get out safely. Again, that's just the uh, way the living you know, situation is different. Turn the slides, please. OK, like this is America. They usually, that's how you see in the suburbs. And you see a rear end of the car more. Turn the slides again. And like a shopping mall, the parking lot, when you walk out, you see the rear end again. So what we did was to make Mazda identifiable, we spent more time designing rear end than a front end, because our counterpart in Japan spent more time designing rear, I mean front end. So to differentiate ourselves from other Jap Japanese designs, we're trying to force our design direction, spending a little more time, and make sure that our rear ends are more memorable. <laughs> I know, I got into trouble with this many, many times when I said that. But uh, really, if you make sense, I mean, if you get out of the door of your house, 80% of the time you're behind the wheel looking at the rear end of the car. You rarely really see the front end of the car unless you stop and get out of the car and walk around. Uh, so it makes more sense scientifically to make rear end more noticeable than other cars. And I think we have identity on its own. So as you may see this car, MX-6, uh, Miata, all have a distinctive uh, rear end compared to most of uh, common Japanese vehicles. Turn the slides, please. And that's about right. <laughs> okay, so if you have any questions, I go into the second part, it's slightly different, it goes. All right, quiet. Now, I talk about a lot of emotional design for exterior of our car in the first part. So I'll give you some a scientific way of design uh, the vehicle. Um, okay. Um, this, is, this is a very crude example. I'll say this is a car. The concept suggests it's a small compact or subcompact sedan or hatchback. Um, it's not performance-oriented vehicles. It's just one of those small car. And translating that particular concept, I'm looking for a pen here. Okay, translating that concept visually to this is we call a visual weight trans, um, visual weight distribution. So.
power statement is not really the huge issue. So the nose part of it is only, say, allocate 10% of the visual weight distribution to this design. But a passenger comfort and safety is very, very important for this type of a car. So we allocate a 6% mass visually to this design. And cargo area package-wise, say, distributed into 30%. So the concept translated into those visual weight distribution. Okay. Now, but this design looks kind of awfully tail heavy here, okay, against that. So we have to visually start adjusting those to make it look like a car can move. So one example, okay, for instance, the top one is just like the other sketch. In order to adjust those visual uh, balance of it, first of all, change this window graphics a little bit like that, which is this one here. So movement here on this first sketch, this is too strong a movement, you know, this window graphics. And leaving this big area is like a dead weight uh, hanging behind the car. In order to get, get rid of those weight, like kicking the rear end back a little bit to reduce the weight, also shift that weight forward by changing this angle a little bit. And also turn the window graphic a little bit more horizontal toward the back. Again, um, get rid of that severe momentum, like, you know, wedge to stop the momentum of the vehicle. This way, you get a flow. At least this is more dynamic moving objects. So these are also, we add a little more volume on the front end of the car to 20%, to 60-20, and at least start to have more feel of dynamic quality of the design. Another kind of exercise I could show you here is when we did the MPV, we study it, okay? The concept says this is not, well, concept says stemmed from the cargo-oriented van. The top one is cargo-oriented van. The reason is the window graphics here says this is the driver compartment, this is a cargo compartment. As you can see, just making a second pillar thicker than the others give you a visual a statement, this is more cargo oriented. Like a Ford Aerostar is this way. Simply making this pillar stronger and connecting this graphically, and this is more like a passenger oriented vehicle with a cargo behind it, okay? So if you really wanna sell the cargo capacity, you should design this way. If you really wanna sell the passenger connotation of the van, this is one of the graphic uh, way of adjusting design to the statement you want to make. So we communicate graphically or body shape wise to the, the people who look at a car, what this car is. We call them a body language or subliminal messages, okay? Another element, for instance, this was an MPV. We lower the roof line towards the back of the van there are two purposes. One, simply aerodynamics. This, this really works really well, just lowering the back end of the roof. Two is the, um, another reason, okay. If we didn't lower the roof, this roof line could be about here, this high, okay, from the rear view. By having that lowering the roof end of the roof, rear view, you have lower roof line. And I, we knew that our van's not gonna be as wide as some other competitors, American-built vans like Chrysler or GM. Their vans are about here, you know, a lot wider. And also, we are the only one with a rear-wheel drive, front-engine rear-wheel drive, just like RX-7 or Miata. We are selling the handling of the vehicle. So we wanted to make sure this vehicle connotates the stability amongst all the vans. So we did it, the first van in the world did the horizontal tail end. Stability again. Most of the other vans had very narrow vertical tail end. Departure from typical cargo van, we went for more of a station wagon kind of uh, driving machine instead of just a, a cargo hauler. Again, little lights here start to bring your eye down. So again, uh, connotates that stability by doing elements carefully located to the design. Okay. 
Okay, um, next one is a Chrysler minivan. This is a second generation. As you can see, the uh, lights are such, but this time they made it those light shorter. It used to be this tall. Okay, first generation was that tall a tail lamp, and rear bumper really sit on the bottom like this. And window was much smaller. You know, rear window was about this. Okay. Now, although this design, the second generation, uh, modernized the design, but I think lost a lot, little bit on that proportioning. First one was very stable because all the elements are very simple elements, you know, that kind of a shape. And the bottom had a bumper. It's really settle, a settling look. Second generation start kicking the bumper up high like this. Also made a window heavier, bigger. So this to me, slowly but surely sending a message, this could tip over because top heavy, the, the weight distribution is wrong. Um, I think slowly sending a message that this is not as stable as the first generation, even though it's look modern. Another example. Am I going okay? I mean, you can follow? Okay. This is the uh, GM APV series of vans. During the day, this van did everything right, okay? Window graphics, nice horizontal theme, nothing up high, everything really low. So it's, you know, distrib weight distribution is nice. And also it's kind of a short and wide vehicle, so it's really nice proportion. However, in the evening, thing changes, okay? This is kind of example of a, of a nighttime. If you follow one of those bands in the nighttime, you see all those tail lamp lit up here and there, making it really annoying narrow angle between the two tail lamps at the nighttime. And when you put the brakes or some, these lit up, making weight distribution so high, changes the, the, the characteristics of the vehicle day and night. Okay, so these are the type of exercise we call visual weight distribution and uh, message. Okay, um, another interesting thing I found when I had this vehicle in the studio. This is a rear end of the Ferrari 275. I remember this car to be very muscular and powerful looking thing, but in the inside of the studio, this didn't have that kind of a flex of a muscle at all. What it was, was like you were encased in this kind of a box. The pressure, atmospheric pressure within the box is not as much as the outdoor. So when this was placed in the indoor, the pressure from within the body to support the pressure outside is not visible indoor, okay? But as soon as we push the vehicle to the outside, okay, then all of a sudden this whole atmospheric pressure is acting against this body shape and all this tension on the skin start to resist against outdoor you know, pressure. And again, that muscle came back. I mean, night, night and day, when just push it out, this happens. And I realized there are some science in this. So we had to be careful when we designed the vehicle too, and I learned some lesson on that one. Okay, next one. Now, this generation of Mazda vehicles have some kind of a, a offset between the upper part of the vehicle against the lower half of the body. RX-7, of course, because of the two-seater, uh, we could pronounce this a lot more than, say, sedan, but we're trying to have every vehicle to have this shoulder pronounced more than just a slub-sided box. What it does, again, is the same thing. Um, you know, first of all, the upper part sits nicely onto the box, so that gives you a stability, and also the angle of these start to pronounce the stability and road-hugging flavor. That's what we needed for our sports cars, 
and all the our sedans are also called sporty or sports sedans. So we needed this kind of a architecture of a design, not the superficial graphics or form or flavor, but just simple architecture design could start changing the personality of the vehicle. Okay. This thing here is the side view of the RX-7. Again, uh, interesting part of this car is a front engine rear wheel drive. So what we've done, okay, this is the engine part. This is a driver. For the sports car, driver and a car as one. I mean, as close as possible. That's the, the, the philosophy of a sports car. Almost you wear the car or whatever. So what we designed, changing this door cuts like that, so you got this compartment connected. So engine and a compartment passenger or driver is one. Okay, psychology, subliminal messages. Nobody will read it this way when you see the car. But these are the kind of thing you can build into the design slowly but surely communicate the messages to the people. And also, because this is rear wheel drive, most of the weight of the vehicle should be on a driving wheel. So by doing this, Okay, the movement of the, the inertia of the weight nicely sits on top of the, this, this rear wheel. So again, not only front engine and drivers are one, but it weights on the driving wheel. So that really suggests this is a rear wheel drive car. Now, evidently, I found that Aaron has a prelude. I hope I'm not going to offend him here. Okay. Now, um, this side of the tail lamp is the actual car's tail lamp. When I saw this vehicle for the same principle, what we've been talking about, this is two pointy angle, and this, and both sides makes it that very uncomfortable triangle for the proportion of the vehicle. It makes your eye goes higher and higher. Never put your eye down here the license plate is high up. If they have a license plate down below, then I start to move this way, so settle the, the gravity down better. Now, this side, I modify a little bit on the tail lamp on the left-hand side, round it off, okay? Here, round this corner. Now, what this does, I start to follow the form, okay? This way. Just turning the radio a little bit larger than what it is. And it then become upper, sits on top, and make it more much steadier design. So just after all the graphics and body structures are done, you can adjust those little minute radii, and still you can refine and fine tune the design uh, messages from the shape to the, the, the people who look at a vehicle. Okay. Another example. Um, you are all familiar with Chevy full-size truck, okay? Now, you also know a um, vehicle called Stepside, is that what you call? Okay, this is a, this is a Stepside, okay? Right? Older Stepside wasn't this way, but because today's modern age of cost cutting, they have to use same tail lamp, and somewhat of the same stamping on a corner. So making a box narrower, but also a tail lamp went inside as well. Makes the, this rear end quite uncomfortable to the rest of the vehicle. It's too narrow for the, the mass of the vehicle. It makes this one not stable and very, very uncomfortable to watch following the rear of this truck on a freeway, okay? So if they would know this, and cost wasn't the issue, they could have done this, okay? Keep the tail lamp further out like older step side was. Older step side had a little shabby lamp on this part here. Keep the eye further apart, making it all stable, okay? So again, um, knowing those elements carefully placing and balancing it, you can change the feeling of a car quite a bit or send the basic messages through the body languages and, you know, subliminal messages too, okay? Then, after I s discover all those theories and methodologies to analyze the design, the first time I came to the States back in 1969, 
the Volkswagen Beetle was very, very popular. Yet all the American cars at a time are as low as about that height and as wide as, you know, twice as wide, wide as this one. But it was so popular, I said, why Beetle was so popular, yet that tall, skinny car, narrow car and tall? And I look at it carefully, I realize what it was. This triangular element here, okay? Keep your eye down, right? And this fender, fender here, supporting that weight in the middle, like that. So it's, even though tall vehicle, but nicely distributed the weight. Then put the bumper here, and then place tail lamps and all this nice, well-balanced manner. So even though it's a tall vehicle, people didn't think this is unstable or, or you know, easy to roll or turn because all the, the visual message you are correct on this vehicle to give you the psychology of safety and everything, okay? So, again, it's interesting to analyze design and this is not really my profession, but when I, whenever I look at a floor plan of the house or building, if the angle and a layout and proportioning is wrong, I believe that when you sit you know, inside of that room, shouldn't be, I mean, should be very, very uncomfortable. Got to be a nice proportion, well-balanced way to be comfortable inside. Now, I do it on the other way. We design the car um, from inside out in a way. Instead of looking into the car, we are coming from inside of the car to start to communicate to the people who are looking onto the car. And that's a new um, slight twist of a, a psychology, but seems to work better for us to communicate our messages. Okay, thank you. A any, any questions at all? Um, okay, here. I, cu I couldn't hear the second part of the question. Uh huh. So, aside from the manufacturers I work for, what would I choose as a daily car? And what was the other question? Oh, um, <laughs> I own four cars and one company car. And four of them, two are Lancias, and one is Di Tommaso Vallelunga, and another one is Miata. All two seaters, um, just by choice. Um, I think I like the low center gravity of seating. I, I, I can't drive the car with high up like the vans or, or, or a sports utility. I get kind of you know, headache and stuff because the center gravity is too high. <laughs> and I kind of like a smaller car too because I guess where, where I grew up, I never really um, associated with huge muscle cars of American V8s and seven liter, eight liter V8s and so. So I always liked the, the smaller motor, high rev motor. So that's kind of a preference too. Um, but every time I had a chance to own or order the car as a company car, I always tried to do the different things. Like the first time I bought the car was just a simple four-seater, I mean four-cylinder sedan. When I came to the States, I bought Fiat A50 Spider, which is a rear-engined convertible sports car. And after that, I bought the X19. Again, it's a midship detachable top sports car. And then the third car was a Chevy Vega wagon because I wanted to know what the wagon's like, you know, just to see what it's like. Ended up helping all the friends moving and stuff. <laughs> um, and then after that, I went to Australia, so I had a chance to drive a V8, five liter V8 sedan, uh, size of our 626, but a five liter V8. Uh, that was quite a spectacular car, but after six months, I didn't have any tread left on the front wheel, so it was a front heavy car. Then I drove many different cars at that time, and then I went to Germany. I bought uh, Audi Quattro Coupe, which is a four-wheel drive, the first high-speed full-time four-wheel drive, five-cylinder, and a turbo. So I wanted to try those, so I bought that one for a while when I was in Germany. 
when I came to Mazda, I wanted to go back to the little sports car, you know, the two-seater convertible. There were none. And all the guys in the studio talked about it. I said, well, let's do one and propose to Japan, see whether we can make it or not. That was the Miata. So the, the, the motive of proposing Miata is more selfish than anything else in a way, that we couldn't afford any other car that we want, like a Ferrari, the others are too expensive. So we wanted to make an affordable car. And we, we thought a lot of more people would be coming to agree to us. So that was the reason why. Um, again, so uh, every time I, I buy cars and stuff, all different reasons for that. And next would be V12 or flat six. V12 is very, very expensive cars, only Ferraris and Jaguars and so forth. And a flat six, of course, would be a Porsche 911. You know, technically different vehicle. Um, right now, you know, I don't, I don't really know. Um, new cars for daily usage that uh, our MX-6 is pretty good, and sports car, the RX-7 is pretty good. I mean, I'm not doing a commercial, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> feels pretty good. Um, other, other manufacturers, I don't really feel any particular car that I want to really drive at this point in time, uh, but a historic car, there are many, many cars I wanted to drive. And yes? How I compare with what? Oh, preparing? Okay. <laughs> So how do I prepare for obsolescence of uh, combustion engines and to come into a new age? Okay, um, okay. private mode of transportation, as far as United States is concerned, I think will survive for many, many years to come because sheer size of the country, you cannot economically support the public transport, okay? In a way the cities, and then next inner city connections and so forth. It's just not feasible and economical as a country to do uh, public transportation like Europe or Japan. The density of the population and so forth. So this will be the last country in the world that will have a private motor transportation of some kind. That's my belief. Another reason why the gasoline will be still the cheapest way of propelling those vehicles. That's why the USA goes to every length to protect that interest. Okay, I mean, really, um, because of that, okay, if U.S. lose the control of gasoline, the vulnerability of the country, that's one of the reasons why, although U.S. may have enough reserve, but still wanted to protect that throughout the world, because of the same reason, that's the most economical way of organizing the country, okay? Now, I had a very difficult time thinking about myself driving a, designing an electric car, and I never had a heart designing it. I love those cars and start analyzing why I love designing gasoline engines cars, other than beside that I got a gas head from when I was three. You know, I had to convince myself that there a day comes for me to design an electric car. And I analyzed it. The, the gasoline engine car is just like a animal's heartbeat, the temperature, the, if you cut one of those plumbing lines of breathe and stay, just like li living thing and based on all the nature's principles, so to speak. Electric car, on the other hand, is very, very digital. I mean, it's sparks and, you know, no temperature. I mean, no noise or whatever. Uh, gasoline engine cars, if the engine's not running right, exhaust sound is different, just like a human body, as you can see. Um, so that's why I think I have a love for designing the gasoline engine car, because closer attachment to the living thing. And I think a lot of people feel the same way. A lot of people name their cars with their names, you know, pet names and so forth. You don't want to pet name the TV or telephones uh, or, or, you know, washing machines, okay? But a car. And they made a lot of movie about a cars, but I never seen the movie made of telephones or washing machine, except maybe computer. But, uh, so. That was an analogy that why I love cars and why I love to design them. So opposite end of that is the electric car. It's not all the things I love to, to deal with or I couldn't put my mind to associate it with. So when I come to that, if I designed an electric car, it would be appliances, not a automobile that I know. 
then I could design all sorts of things, like CD player, you know, pu push the bot door, the door slides out, and you can sit in and go back in. All sorts of, uh, <laughs> you know, all sorts of gauges and stuff, all the lights and sounds. It's like, so if we're gonna have Miata kind of electric car, then it could be like amusement park, you know, the neon lights and all sorts of stuff. And when I thought about that, um, because a car is a living thing, they were required to go to all the terrains, okay? Not only nice, smooth surface, they're going to rough road. They ask you to do all the corners and turns. You never ask a toaster to wash your clothes or, you know, hair dryer to do your washing or whatever. So appliance is a single purpose. So if I could design the appliance as a single purpose to go to school and back or go to shopping and back, then you don't need the suspensions and stuff then you may be able to do a better electric car than what we are trying to do right now. The reason why we're trying to do, I feel like everybody's having an inferior complex about electric cars, so try to negate that by saying electric cars as fast as the gasoline cars. You know, trying to negate that. But I feel like a real electric car is gonna come in maybe five, 10 years from now without any complex at all purpose-built to certain reasons, and I think structures and cities and stuff may be cap capable of handling that type of a vehicle. Um, automatic navigation also, digital control of electric car is far better suited to the digital control from uh, sky, you know, like satellite, um, to do an automatic trans uh, freeway, so forth, rather than controlling this living thing with mine on its own called automobile with the gasoline engines and stuff. I think it's electric is far more digital to control that and conducive to that too. Did that answer your question? Some odd way, but that's, okay. Safety? Okay, well, okay, safe, how we design incorporating safety of the car. Um, the safety is pretty much, uh, regulated in certain uh, dimensions and so forth. So only difference car to car is inertia weight may change, require a longer distance to the nose and stuff, but a lot of other elements are pretty much standardized throughout the world. For instance, the headlights supposed to be about um, four inches off the bumper surface to protect it from, you know, like 10 mile per hour crash or so. That's this rule that everybody had to follow. Um, Turn indicator lens can, you know, I mean, in a side impact, you have to have a certain size structural rigidity onto certain heights where the bumper hits and so forth. So it's pretty much regulated. So when we design, engineer give you criteria to follow in the safety area. Yes. So, so if you're looking into the future 20, 30 years ahead, what is that be or what I think or how? Well, like I said, <laughs> 25 years to 30 years is the easy one because you don't have to be held responsible for it by the time it happens. But joke aside, um, no, simple, as long as people live, I mean, user of the vehicle or product is a human then human needs has to be answered in any given time, either today or 100 years ago or 200 years from now. So if you're looking into your own future of human needs to answer to that needs 20, 30 years from now, and looking into technology available, maybe not to daily technology, but technology could be available. For instance, the electric car. Having a battery in a vehicle is one of the major, major weight penalty for the the electric car today. So final goal, 20 years from now, the electric car will not gonna have a battery. That's my assumption. The reason is, if you look at a transistor radio, started off with that thick, now it's a paper thin, because they get rid of the, the, the battery from the, the radio, and just small enough to rechargeable battery ended up making it cart paper, you know, paper thin radio. 
So eventuality is one of those power waves like from the satellite hitting the, the vehicle surface and that translates or amplifies some kind of a power wave that propels the, the electricity within the electric vehicle to propel the motor. And I think that's just a dream, but again, makes sense, okay? Less weight and much more feasible accident, no acid involved like a battery is. An overall ecosystem of recyclability or producing battery far more uh, uh, reasonable, make more sense more and more you think about it. So this is far-fetched maybe, but I believe that there will be no battery in an electric car in the, in the future. So this is a type of uh, thinking process I use to come up with the 25 years ahead. Aesthetic-wise, you know, the aesthetic-wise, the, 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 the today's concept cars are like going back 20, 30 years in the, in the, the design direction. Um, retro, unfortunately, played by a lot of people and are some of the designers ourselves. Retro is not really the superficial shape again, like. To me, the retro is why it's so popular, because bring the warmth that we had 20, 30 years ago. The life was much warmer, simpler, family value and all that. I think that's what this retro is about. That shape connotates that kind of uh, uh, images and time. And also, each engineer or company had a philosophy of their own building their own car. It's not a mass production a certain way. They build it personality, the individuality, and I think retro really represent not just the superficial design directions, but also the time and flavor that we had in the past that needed today or next, you know, next five to 10 years. We like to have the peace and warmth and innocent kind of uh, future, you know, for hoping for the future to be better. I think we, everybody looking for that. And that's one of the reasons why that warmth is came back to the design. Does that answer your question some more? Okay. Go that way. Okay, so how we design the cars, knowing the constraints working between Ford and Mazda. Okay, Probe wa was designed in Japan right next to, they have a studio of their Ford's own studio within the Mazda building in the Hiroshima, Japan. They share engineering, so Mazda engineers develop those vehicles. So Ford may want to do their own concept vehicle within the guidelines dimensionally by Mazda engineers. Same time, Mazda designer team will do their proposals and start to look at two proposals and trying to commonize as much as uh, you know we can within the sheet metal, within the all the the invisible mechanism of it. But the sheet metal exterior appearances and all is all different. They're built under the same floor pan and all the same constraints, yet exercise totally different. Okay, that's a probe and and uh, MX-6. And uh, trucks case, the Rangers case, um, we came on a program later, so we didn't have a chance to propose what we'd like to see as a future truck. But we had to live with what Ford done so far, and then we had to take that to make a Mazda identity. So it's a slightly different uh, way. No, actually, uh, it was, it, interesting to work with a Ford engineering because I personally used to work with the American School of Design System and for me to learn how to work with a Japanese system is harder even though I'm Japanese and I speak the language and everything but it's very difficult but working with a Ford is a lot easier because I know the system how it works and uh, design wise I think you know we had a lot more sheet metal to change like all the hood and fenders and cargo area except the doors and glasses so and when you see the real car side by side, you know, when truck come, hits the road and see, compare the two, you will see the difference between the two. Yes. Nineteen ninety-five. 
1998, the zero emission. Zero emission, what do we do? Well, we've been investigating uh, hydrogen rotary engines. Uh, we've been presenting a couple show cars, and that's one of the directions, because evidently the rotary engine principle works really well with the hydrogen power. So it's working really well. I drove one in Japan uh, a couple months ago, and feels just like any other. And, it's, and all you can get out of it is just the water. I used to tease them, they should have a little faucet at the back of the car so you can drink the water or whatever. You know, identifying the, the hydrogen. But that's one direction. Of course, there are technical research group we doing all sorts of uh, electric car proposals, of course. But which ones to come out would be feasibility of economy and so forth, too. Okay, how the, the influence between designs of the engines and design of the sheet metal, one influence the other or work together, or whatever. Um, it all depends, like if we really like the certain direction of the shape and if that dictates the direction, then we must work with the engineer to drop the heights of the motor down. Like in case of Miata, we had an initial uh, first clay model you've seen the nose is about that, the hood is that much taller. Then we work slowly, the engineer drops the motors to get to where it is. So that's one scenario. Another scenario is like, there are certain way we design the car, but if we have to have a diesel for European and Japanese market, and then certainly diesel is a lot taller. So we had to change the design to accommodate that. So it's case by case really. Okay, uh, composite rather than sheet metal. Uh, a lot of people misled that composite answers all the questions you may have, the weights and recyclability and so forth. But major thing is how to build the vehicle, vehicles, the manufacturing plant, the manufacturing line. Overall, the sheet metal still, stamping sheet metal way it's built right now, the welding and so forth, is far more, um, Economical is one and far more recyclable also than, say, composite materials. Um, and overall energy usage, too. So total ecosystem, I mean, sheet metal is not that bad at all. Although the other one sounded better and sounds newer and higher technology, but it's not necessary. so. Until time comes, maybe they're, you know, the, the other side may be far better totally uh, ecosystem, then that might be the case. Could I have a break? <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you.